Hey, it's Joey Baldana here from Anthrax, and this is Sagas. Oh. oh, oh! Look, this is a big one. I didn't break out and join the podcast today. It is now time for Devil's Advocate. Same time, same place, or something. What's going on, everybody? This is Corbin, the Serpent Tongue Skip with, and I'm here with very special guest. If you want to introduce yourself. Hey, what's going on, guys? Uh, my name is Billy, also known as Ghost from uh, the band Unrequited. Nice. And this is Sagas. I'm so excited to have you on. Thank you again for taking time. Yeah, man. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, so we've been we've been talking for a while on Instagram. Um, I don't know how you ended up finding my page because I think you followed me first. And then I followed you back and then we started talking. So either way, it's uh, however you found, found my page, I'm very happy. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. I do follow tons of people on Instagram, so. Nice. Um, So, I wanted to talk, so it was, it was a tough choice for me which one to choose because it was between me, um, me personally, it was between your 2021 album, Beautiful Ghosts, and then this latest EP, Perpetual Green of the Willow Groves. But I thought to myself, you know, the EP is the more recent one, so I figured it's more, um, obviously, it's more fitting to do that one in my head. So, all right. So we're going to talk about the EP, as I just said, Perpetual Green of the Willow Groves. So talk me through it. So, so, so as I just said, 2021, you had Beautiful Ghosts. Talk us from that point. Where did this EP come from? How long ago after Beautiful Ghosts? Just, just a walk the audience through. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, Beautiful Ghosts was the last, um, you know, full length effort that I did in 2021. It was a pretty big um, departure from my usual writing style which is kind of like uh, i usually write about you know myself and and life and uh what i'm going through and beautiful ghost was kind of a departure i was writing about a significant other you know there was a a muse directly responsible for that so that was a little different and then um after that uh usually the mentality is every time i do a record the next one i just kind of want to do the complete opposite and just really switch it up and i don't know keep the audience like on their toes and guessing what they're going to get i think fans know at this point that they're just going to get what they're going to get and they can't really expect anything in particular um and it the ep came about uh it was actually the label that reached out uh flowing downward uh i've worked with the owner in the past because he works for uh, avant-garde music as well but he reached out because sadness uh wanted to do a split and so he reached out to me asking me if I wanted to be a part of it. And I was like, sure, you know, I've worked with sadness before we've done a, like a five way split uh, back in like 2017, I think. So I was like, sure, let's, let's do it. Let's make something. I was like, what are we doing? What's the, uh, <laughs> what's like the frame that we're working around. And he was like, well, sadness is working on like a really long song. You know, it's probably going to be around like a 20 minute song. And I was like, cool. Okay. I can probably try to do that. Maybe. <laughs> I don't think I've written it's the longest song I've ever written I've never done anything I think the longest thing I had done before that was 13 minutes so I was like hey 20 minute song let me uh let me try to figure this out and um I knew I wanted to kind of add a, a new element beautiful ghost saw the addition of very heavy like clean vocals and so on this one I was like what if I did something like lyrical something more black metal you know something that I haven't really done in the past so I just started writing some lyrics and stuff like that. And I had a couple of instrumentals I was working on kind of in parallel. And I ended up kind of just mashing the two together into one song. The the track is like 21 minutes long, but it's really just a part one and a part two. Like it's two different songs. So yeah, the first one was just a pretty big departure. I wanted to do like more traditional black metal vocal style and have lyrics and all that and just be like, oh, I've never done this before. So let's completely switch it up for uh, the EP. I think doing splits EPs is like a really good place to like really switch it up and really tr- be experimental and try something different. So that was kind of the idea. Nice, nice. Now, because you know the um the times that I was that I was listening to it, I did I did really feel that you know that part one part two thing you're talking about because it's you know the yeah. First one, you know what's what's really cool though, and I only picked this up like strongly the um the latest times I've listened to it, but um so as the song. Con- like as a song continues, I um, you, like what I perceive as like torturous screams in the background. 
That's what it sounds like, like scream. And I'm like, dude, that's cool. It sounds like someone's in like a torture chamber, just like while right. the storm's going. Like, you know, kind of like you hear those rumors of like, about like um, Guantanamo Bay, how they'll play like heavy metal music with like dogs barking in the background. Like, that's kind of yeah. like, how I perceive it. It's like, oh, someone's just being forced to listen to this while being tortured. And um, maybe it wasn't <laughs> the um, the idea you're going for, but but that's how it sounded to me. Yeah, fair enough. I think that's, uh, I think there's no wrong interpretation of like, you know, that kind of very strange vocal style. It's not very common. So <laughs> I've heard a lot of different kind of weird in interpolations of like what that's supposed to be. Uh, that is that is kind of the traditional unrequited vocal style. Like that's what I've done in the past up until this point. It's mostly those kind of atmospheric wails. And uh, I just think it's like a really good atmosphere and it's a really good, like, I don't know. The music I make isn't particularly black metal. That song is like, th this is kind of the darkest stuff I've ever done, but I tend to write a lot of like prettier melodies and stuff like that. A lot of like post rock influence. So the, uh, the wailing vocals really adds an element of like, it's kind of disturbing and it's kind of strange and it's kind of enigmatic a little bit. So I, I kind of like that. Usually hear that over like some really horrible lo-fi black metal, but I was like, what if I make like pretty melodies and throw that on top? I think that'd be kind of cool. <laughs> So. nice now it, it it definitely does sound more polished and more you know i don't want to say professional but like more mastered than than your everyday black metal album and it's weird because you know i used to do a lot of reviews back in the day um but now I'm focusing more on podcasts and interviews but when i was doing reviews a few years ago i i didn't notice the boom of black metal artists coming out all of a sudden in, in like the underground the indies it's like fucking hell like when i was a teenager you just had really the Norwegian classic black metal um, tier, you know, the tier one, tier two bands, and then some yeah. new bands like Goat Whore. But like, but like this, it's it, it it's weird to hear such a um such a a blossom in black metal. It's like lately in, in the past in the past what less than twenty years, fifteen years. It's like it, it's insane to me because you know, like I said, when I was growing up, you didn't have that many choices. You you had the classic Norwegian shit a few mm -hmm. new games but it was very low-key kept and now it, it like it almost feels mainstream which is ironic because the death from mayhem his last wish was <laughs> hope it doesn't get mainstream so it's kind of yeah cool. yeah <laughs> it's it's kind of nuts because yeah i think that was kind of always the black metal ethos was sort of to be the anti-music and like not being happy with uh the current state of metal and not wanting to like remain stagnant wanting to make the opposite because death metal was really popping off when black metal bands started and they were like you know fuck this death metal shit we want to make something that's like way greedy or whatever and uh, i think i've said this in like interviews before but the thing that i like about black metal is kind of like reapplying that same ethos to the genre like never being happy with where it's at and never stagnating trying to add to it and, and you know stuff like that and i think that's cool because like like you said, there's tons of black metal bands nowadays, but it's also seems to be the genre that has kind of like broken off into the most little subgenres. There's just like so many micro genres of black metal that it's like, I don't know, it's just really interesting to see how uh, that genre has evolved. Yeah, no, it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely one of my favorite um, subgenres for sure. I mean, I, I'm very much a, with certain subgenres. I'm very much, a, I'm very much a, a traditionalist, so to speak. Um, when it comes mm -hmm. to black metal, I really there's very few bands. The band I listen to today that's a modern band is Panopticon. That guy, yeah. like I love that guy. But besides him, I, I'm I'm all Norwegian '80s black metal okay. like whole time. But um, yeah. So so yeah, it is it like it is interesting when I'm like when I was reviewing like five black metal bands a week, and I'm like, what the fuck? Like 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 you know where are they all blossoming from? But I mean I mean it is cool to see it, but it's just like I guess the teenager in me is like. Uh, where where we where was all this when I was growing up? You know, in the early yeah, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I mean, yeah. The other thing is like, there's there's also like various amounts of black metal that still remains within those micro genres. Like, I still get categorized as black metal quite often, but if you were really to like delve into my whole discography, you'd be like, eh, it's not really black metal, you know? Like, there's not really that much of black metal like left. <laughs> like, when you just really peel away the layers, you're like, hey, there's like 10% blast beats. There's like, there's the screaming, which is there, but it's like, hey, the melodies are all pretty and the song structure is more like poppy and crescendo like 
Yeah, it's just like I get categorized a lot as black metal, but also it seems to piss people off because it's they're right. Like it's not really black metal at the end of the day. It's just there are a lot of black metal influences. But yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've got to ask, when it comes to so how do you um do you do it do you have any like special special procedures before going into the booth to like sing? scream like i mean because the voice would just like i talked to ram my co my co-host he's a singer of his band and like and like he doesn't even do hardcore screaming but like he says his voice gets you know can get fucked up from time to time like how do you prepare for that yeah um so before i started this project i was the vocalist in like a metalcore kind of new metal band <laughs> and uh that was more traditional like vocal style like more like you know fry vocal screaming uh so that involved like you know some technique and some maintenance because we were touring pretty frequently and i had to do it every night and not like wreck my voice um but the style that i do with unrequited is like pretty much like throw all technique to the wind and just make it sound as crazy as possible and uh usually that involves like a very unhealthy <laughs> tracking method so it's not really something that's like overly sustainable in like a live setting because in studio i'm just like wrecking my throat just doing just to get the best takes so i'll have to find a workaround for live because i'm starting to do that now uh but yeah in studio there's like really no technique it's just like try to make it sound crazy um yeah i can only imagine because like because unfortunately for my girlfriend, I'm a massive chatterbox. Like I never shut mm. up. So, so, so my voice is always, you know, and sometimes I wake up with a sore throat. So I can't imagine <laughs> like someone who screams for a little, like I just can't imagine maintaining that, you know, it's like, a, it's like a no. new level of respect. <laughs> yeah. I usually do like the whole album screams in like one day, like I'll just kind of bash it all out in one take and then I'll, I'll suffer for like a day or two after that. And that's it. <laughs> Nice. Sounds like a brutal schedule, as you said. Um, <laughs> well, I don't have to do it super often, so it's okay. Oh, that's good. Um, do you ever get into moods? Like, like you know, I can only imagine, especially with the different styles that you work with, there has to be times when you're making, when you're thinking about recording a song or EP album, whatever it is, and when you're not feeling up to it, sh surely, surely there has to be times when you're like, you know what? This track sounds perfect as an instrumental. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I feel that way about most of Unrequited's music because it the vocals are a lot of the time just kind of uh, an added texture and stuff. And usually the instrumental is paramount. And like, I'm definitely more of a composer than anything else. So I'm generally writing the music part of it. And then, you know, the vocals are just kind of an added piece that I get to throw on top. Um, but often I'm, I'm writing like without the vocals in mind, you know, I'm just writing the instrumental. That's what I really like doing is the composition. So when I do write lyrical music, you know, I have to approach it a little bit differently, but um, I definitely consider myself as more of like an instrumental writer. Like, yeah. You know, one of my favorite, um, and obviously I'm not sure, I'm not sure how far you deviate, like how far your, your taste in music goes. Um, like, I mean, for metal, but the, mm -hmm. um, the artist, James Blake, like he did the same thing. He's like a pop, he's a uh, kind of rap techno artist. And um, his okay. first five EPs was all instrumental. And then I guess he decided to sing one day. <laughs> and, now, yeah. and, now, and now he sings as well as, but he's mainly uh, instrumental. Like he started as an instrumentalist and now he sings in his record. It's just like, yeah. No, yeah no, that's it's cool. interesting when like someone makes that decision. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've done like lots of lyrical music, you know, and I still do. I mean, I still have multiple projects and like two two of my projects I'm singing or I'm doing screaming and they're like lyrical, like I'm writing all the lyrics and I'm writing with the lyrics of mine. So I still do a lot of that. It's just that like, uh, like you said, you're a chatterbox, like I'm the opposite. I am a man of like very few words. I don't speak a whole lot and uh, I don't get like fulfillment from talking to people. I get my emotional outlet from like composing that's just kind of how i let it out uh so yeah that's that's just the main thing for me is like that is my one and only outlet like there's nothing else well i definitely can't let my girlfriend see this episode she will dump me and uh you will be like oh finally someone who doesn't talk as much <laughs> <laughs> does, does she not talk as much because i mean opposites definitely attract in that regard oh, nah, she, she wants to i'm just 
I'm, like I have a disease in the head. I can't shut up. She just can't get a word in edgewise when you're talking. Uh, I feel bad. Like, you know, when I think about it at night, I'm like, I feel bad. But then, like, I can't stop it. <laughs> it's, been, it's been 10 years in January. So it's like, wow, all this awesome. fucking thing must be just draining. <laughs> um, yeah. So, look, so, so where did the, um, I'm curious. And this is, I guess this has been one of the main attractions for me. I'm um, listening to this EP. What, where did the name come from? The, the, the EP. EP. Okay. Uh, well, technically, the EP itself is just is just called "Sadness Slash Unrequited" because we didn't give it a title. Um, and then I just named my song "Perpetual Green of the Willow Groves." Um, uh-huh. The yeah, it's just called Pet- "Perpetual Green" on like streaming platforms because I uploaded it into independently, so that's why. But uh, the name came from. Well, basically, when we had started conceptualizing for the EP with the label, uh, they had brought up the idea of colors, uh, like just kind of having a color, each each track having its own color, and then just having like a song based on that color or, you know, based around a color, I don't know, some, some sort of like thematic thing to like, you know, tie it together. Because the songs are, pre- are pretty different. If you have listened to Sadness's song, it's like completely the opposite. Uh, not completely, but, you know, they're just very different. Uh, so he went with the color red, and his track is called Red Room Autumn Tension, I believe. Red Room Autumn Tensions. And uh, I was like, okay, cool. I'll, I'll pick a color and I'll try to write around it. And then, <laughs> like, that's just kind of the one that came to mind. I think I had the title first, and then I started writing the lyrics because I just thought the title was cool. Like, I was trying to, I was like, okay, what what color do I identify with? I don't want to go generic and go, like, black or, like, gray or, like, something <laughs> super, like, black metal and dark. Uh, although it would have fit like the color theme nicely because the red and green looks like kind of funny and like Christmassy, <laughs> but um, I went with green because I wanted to do like a nature themed um, lyrical piece where you know it kind of all revolves around like a foresty death scene. I guess I write a lot of lyrics about dying for some reason. <laughs> um, I'm okay though, I, I promise. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I just went with green because I wanted to do like a nature scene. Basically, I just wanted to have that kind of imagery, and uh, yeah, I don't think it really went any deeper than that. It was just like we we're gonna do a colors thing, and I had to pick one. He had already picked red, so I I just kind of went with my gut and picked something that I felt comfortable writing about. And then the album cover just kind of ended up ended up looking goofy, like in my opinion, just the red and green is kind of Christmassy and. But it's fine. I'm not super mad about it. No, no, that's a pretty, you know, yeah, that is a pretty interesting because, like, yeah, it, when I was listening to um the the times I was listening to the album, it's just like the album cover and the how I took it, the the cryptic title was just like intriguing to me because I really love um I'm a huge fan um like I have a like I have a big passion for like poetry and like literacy literature. I've always in, I was always that was the one thing I was good at in high in, in high school was English mm. English and literacy okay. um, and so I always loved like reading interesting titles or names or anything like literature based and so yeah that title kind of stuck up to me I, as I was listening to the album I was just like staring at my phone like huh, perpetual green of the <laughs> I was just like I, don't know, I was like saying to myself because like mm-hmm. that sounds interesting I wonder what it's about I wonder I wonder I wonder what the meaning behind it is and obviously you just told right. me but um, yeah no, it's, it's cool. Yeah, the whole thing is just like, uh, f- like kind of uh, talking about like upon death, you know, becoming one with nature, and then there's lyrics about like you know being uh, blanketed by the green sheet of the earth, and uh, you know stuff like that. Uh, I don't know. I kind of like the the death topic. It's kind of fun to write about in different ways, and yeah. like feels cathartic in some way. I don't know why, but uh, yeah, I like the nature scene and all that. There's nothing like super deep about the title i just kind of wanted to put together like a cool phrase that encompassed the lyrics or what i wanted to write about before writing them and uh yeah it's funny uh english is what i was very good at in high school as well but uh i'm like dog shit when it comes to speaking (laughs) but i can write it's um it's interesting because like i was raised for the 18 years of my life i was raised i was raised in the church as a mormon my mom and dad Mm. are still they're still religious. They still go to church every Sunday. Um, and they teach you there, like, like from young age to publicly speak, like, talk mm. every Sunday. So it's like, I naturally just develop that. If, if, if I didn't go to church, I'll be the same. 
Like I wouldn't have that. Um, but you know, it's funny when I was in high school, when I was in year eight, year nine, I remember specifically we had this really old teacher um, and he, it was about poetry. He's like, all right, I want you all to write this specific poetry style. Um, about, um, so it was about a book. I forgot what the book was. It was about a book. And, you know, I was all excited. Everyone else in the class was like, you know, complaining and shit. It's like, oh, poetry. But I was so excited. And I wrote my thing. And I kid you not, this is what, and like, it's still probably, probably my proudest achievement of my life. The guy said, and this guy's like 60 plus years old. He, he looked at my poetry and he said, he said, you have a very unique poetry style that, that not many people in the world have, but it was the wrong kind of poetry as I was asking for. Mm. And I was <laughs> oh, like, that sucks. <laughs> That's such a nice compliment, but yeah, yeah but so, it's not what I wanted. <laughs> yeah, so I've always had it. Yeah, like I've always been intrigued with like yeah everything, literature, poetry, and um, and that's why metal is such a is such a it's such an interesting place for me because it's like you can have so many you know so many bands out there that just put an interesting spin on things or do a conceptual thing. It's just it's just like there's so many paths, and obviously most of them use words and whether mm-hmm. that be album names um track lists whether it be obviously lyrics um mm-hmm. one of my favorite bands him the finnish band mm-hmm. like nice. Val Valo, ah, he's yep. like so it's, it's just like oh, i just you know like you know anytime i see a really intricate lyricist in in like in any genre but specifically metal it just makes me so happy <laughs> yeah no there's like a very wide uh variety of like topics within metal too i mean you just write about really anything and make it brutal or make it cool it's like very it's like a really very nerdy genre i guess once you really delve into it which is fun i'm a huge nerd so nice nice i can definitely relate to you there um so do you reckon this would be oh wait before i ask that i'll go back have you have you had the opportunity to perform this live yet no i've been thinking about it but would it be uh, hard, do you think? You? I don't think it'd be hard because, well, I I really want to perform the first half of uh, Perpetual Green, uh, like the the whole lyrical part. I just, um, you know, we're we're gearing up for like our very first tour ever right now because this has been a solo project up until this year when uh, the touring opportunity arose, and I happened to gather some friends who said yes to being in the live band, which is great. Um, but I was like, okay, well, I'm going to have to start putting together a live set. And then, you know, I put together the songs that I thought kind of encompassed, like I have such a massive catalog. I have six records, I think like six full lengths and then a bunch of other, you know, small things in between. And I have a 30 minute set for this tour and hours of music. So I really need to narrow it down. So I was only really able to pick like four or five songs, like one from each album kind of thing. And Perpetual Green is one of those like songs where it's like, it's really long. Both parts are really long. They're each like 10 minutes. So that takes up a third of the set. Plus it's not any of like the main songs that are on a full length record that people would kind of be expecting to hear. So it's tough. It's kind of tough to fit it in. Plus it is the one outcast that like out of all of my songs that has like lyrics. So it'd be kind of weird to just do one lyrical song and then the rest of them goes back to just the, the wailing and stuff, uh, the atmospheric wails. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to I'm gonna exclude it for now for this tour and just kind of play more like well-known unrequited songs. But I really want to sneak it in at some point. So I'm thinking like we're, we're lining up some other stuff for this upcoming year. So I'm thinking I'm going to try to slip it in at some point because it would be really cool to play live. I don't think it would be hard because... Uh, like that vocal style is actually a lot easier for me to do. (laughs) So if I could do all the songs like that, that would actually be great. Nice. Um, You you have to, if you do, I mean, not if, when you do, um, Mm -hmm. you gotta, you gotta, you have to get some footage because I want to see that. Yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I, there's always a couple of videos that will probably come out from every show because We've only played one show. We just did the one uh, festival in Montreal like a f- month ago or something like that. And there were like so many people there for our set. I was completely blown away. Like it was our first show. I wasn't really expecting anyone to show up, but it was like a packed room and like tons of people were filming, which is awesome because I get to see the performance and see how bad I did. <laughs> um, no, nah, it's, it's, yeah, it, it's, it will definitely be something, like I said, that I'll be, that I'll, that I'll have my eyes on. 
Um, you know, uh, it kind of it kind of reminded me. Um, <laughs> it's it's uh, on an episode of so I guess like ages ago. We um we talked to this band from Fiery Tongues. They're like an uh, they're like a band camp band that I've now kind of blown yeah. up the last year. Um, okay. They're a Filipino band, and they came cool. together in the COVID lockdown. Um, and it's funny because we were talking to one of the members. I forgot I forgot what he played in the band, but he he told us that they formed a lockdown and they made this amazing album um, that I found on Bandcamp. And once it once the lockdown was over and once they got back to touring, um, being able to tour, they were like, he said to me, he's like, "Fuck, fuck, we didn't think about the the actual physical." playing of the song. The ability of the songs, yeah. <laughs> like, they were making it this polished masterpiece in their minds, but then they didn't think about the realisticness of playing it. And, yep. like, and yeah, as soon as, as soon as the touring opportunity came, they're like, fuck, how are we yep. going to do this? Um, 100%. So, like, how, like, because obviously you would have been making music, I mean, I mean, I don't know how, how hard Canadian, uh, can, Canada got hit with lockdown, but it must have Pretty been... Hard. Was it hard for you guys or for you? Um, I, I wouldn't say that I was like particularly affected super heavily by lockdown. Uh, I was like doing music full time at the time. So yes. I was already pretty isolated in my room every day doing nothing except working on music. Uh, so I wasn't really affected all that hard. I kind of <laughs> sounds kind of bad, but like I kind of like, enjoyed it a little bit. <laughs> it was Fair like, uh, it was like, ah, oh, people weren't like, I don't know. I, like, I could wear a mask in public and people kind of stay away from me. I was like, oh, this is great. But whatever. Obviously, it was horrible and uh, would never want to go back to something like that. And it was tragic in a lot of cases. So, yes. yeah, it was bad in general. But for me, I, like, I just really wasn't super affected. Um, I make music by myself. So it's like it didn't affect like meeting up with band members or anything like that. Um, yeah, I can't really think of any like particularly negative ways it affected me apart from actually getting COVID a couple of times, which sucked. <laughs> I think I got it during last Christmas. So wow. I couldn't actually do Christmas with my family or anything. So, but yeah, it didn't really affect like, um, the music or, or really anything like that. It just kind of reinforced the habits that I already had. Yeah. No, nah, no. Nah, like I said, I totally get that, you know, like. Melbourne got hit pretty hard. Australia, Melbourne, Australia got hit. Um, it's funny hearing it, hearing hearing what happened to us on like American or like or like you know it, or like um fucking international podcasts. Like they're like, oh, they were you know <laughs> like they're calling it martial law and stuff over here. But it's like it was pretty bad at one point. Like yeah, stage four lockdown. Like we couldn't. The rules at its worst were like you couldn't leave three kilometers outside your house. <laughs> okay you need to really reinforce something like that that's the thing like it wasn't really, it wasn't really realistic i mean sometimes police drove by every now and then but like it wasn't enough to reinforce it and you needed um for, from your work um uh, because i work at a um at a grocery store that makes sushi so 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 um if you were working they gave you work passes so in case you're pulled over okay and then, yeah. and then it proves why you're three kilometers out we did that as well at some point, but it didn't last very long, I don't think. I do remember that happening for sure. Like, uh, we're on the border of Quebec, Ontario and Quebec, and Ottawa is, like, right there. So a lot of people work either on one side or the other, and they had, like, the bridges closed down, and you had to have, like, one of those work passes to cross the bridge. Yeah. So, yeah, we were doing that. And I remember very briefly, we had a curfew, and cops were kind of circling around neighborhoods. Like you couldn't be out past like seven. That was actually kind of scary and dystopian, but uh, yeah, it was brief. Like it didn't last very long. Yeah, and it's like yeah, um, like I remember, and there was like a curfew, like like nine p.m. I think it was. Yeah, and I was yep. and I was just like walking my dog for a bit, and then I'm um, come back at like seven p.m. after work. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, yeah. I'm home by. Um, no, it was pretty crazy, and, and obviously, well, I mean, here at least in Melbourne, everything's gone back to normal. Mask aren't mandatory. Yep. Um, it's just completely, pretty much completely normal now. So, yeah, I would say that's the case here as well. We did uh, vaccine passports for a little bit. Like I said, I'm a server. I'm a server, so I do that like three ish times a week. And we did do um, we did do vaccine passports at the restaurant for a little while, but we stopped. Yeah, was the vaccines mandatory? Yes. Yeah, they yeah. were here too. So I got my two injections. Yeah, me too. Um, 
but I didn't feel anything. Some people say, I mean, you know, my arm felt dead. It felt sore for a bit, but that's it. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't really have any like response to it. Like some people, like my mom, for example, every time she gets a vaccine, she knows she's going to get sick. Like she just gets sick every single time. And like yep. she did for all three of her boosters and everything. So it's like, yeah, that, that kind of sucks. But, uh, I feel like for some reason, my immune system is like really good. I don't get sick ever. Like I did get COVID twice, but like prior to that, I hadn't gotten sick in like probably at least half a decade or something like that, which is weird. Like I eat like shit, like (laughs) there's no good reason for my immune system to be good, but I really don't get sick very often. Man, we are so much alike. That's crazy. I haven't literally up until COVID, um, up until COVID, I had none of my none of my vaccines because m- mum doesn't believe in them. Um, mm. So I, I was I was I think the last time I was in, the last time the last time I was at a doctor when I was like three years old, I had like a bad reaction to acid reflux or something, and I was like in the doctor. But now I'm 28, and then I got COVID last year. But that's it. Yeah. I haven't been sick either. <laughs> it's funny that you say like the last time you were at a doctor, you were three, because like. I think I'm like the opposite of like whatever a hypochondriac is like someone who thinks they're like, there's constantly symptoms of illness or whatever. Like, Oh, I need to get that checked out. I need to get that checked out. I'm like the complete opposite where like, I'll feel something and be like, ah, yeah, it's probably nothing. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's, it's weird. Cause like the one thing, the one, the one bad thing I have is like, I have terrible teeth. So Mm -hmm. like, I'm always a dentist and I hate dentists and I've got like six extractions. My teeth are horrible. <laughs> I hate smiling because, like, I hate showing my teeth. But oh, um, dude, your teeth look fine. <laughs> well, on camera, you see me. Yeah. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so besides that, doctors are separate, and like, I like, I never go. So yeah. Yep. So have... we are very much alike. That's funny. How crazy is that? Um, it's pretty nuts. <laughs> um. So, do you have any immediate plans for like a Hopefully like immediate frozen. plans to follow up this EP? Like, like, you know, anything you can tell us about or any ideas? Um, I'm writing a little bit, um, but I would say this is the least prepared I've been, like, after a release. Like, normally, when I, by the time I drop a record, I usually have the next one, like, at least half done. That's generally been the process so far. Like, ever since, like, 2016, that's been the process. Uh, but when I dropped Perpetual Green... I was like, I have nothing like for after this. Like I have zero idea what I'm doing after this, like nothing. So, and I've been working on my other projects a lot. Like um, I have a band called Right Home with my roommate. And it's more of like, uh, do kind of like alternative rock with like some post rock and then some like metal core. It's kind of all over the place. Uh, But I've been working on a lot of music for that. And then I also have like a death core symphonic black metal project (laughs) called the Ember, the Ash. And uh, I'm about to release something next month under that project. And then there's a whole record that I'm working on as well for that. So I just have like a lot of things going on simultaneously. And then I'm just kind of like periodically, like however I'm feeling, uh, whatever mood I'm in, I'll just kind of pick a project, be like, "Ah, I feel like writing this. I feel like writing this. I have a lot of avenues I could go to. Um, but for now, like, um, I do have a decent amount and I have like some ideas. I have a, I have the album title. I have a bunch of song titles. I have like, I don't, I don't know like how much I should say, but I do want to do like a conceptual piece with like, uh, motifs, like repeating musical parts, very like film score esque, uh, project. And I want to make it like just bigger than anything I've done. So I'm going to really take my time with it. Um, we'll see. Uh, now that I'm working with some of my friends in like the live project, I'm going to see if like maybe I can incorporate a couple of them into the uh, into the actual next record. So it's not just, you know, me doing everything. But uh, we shall see. We shall see. You know who you, you know, based on your work ethic, based on your creativity, your ideas, you know who you, you know who you remind me of? Devil Townsend. Yeah. Devil Townsend. Ooh. Uh, like, I have gotten, because, you I know, have gotten that before, but I'm not going to accept that. Obviously, oh come on, <laughs> um, like you know, a genius. It's just like you know, you, you always try new stuff. You you know, like you said, you know, when it comes to your album, you want you want the next thing to be complete opposite. Like he's very much the same. He's very you know, first you have empath, and then and then you have something very different. Like 
presumably. Because I've only yeah. heard his new album once, The Loud House. But, you know, you have like... So it's just like he's always doing something different. You never know what to expect from that guy either. And it's just like, you just have the same vibe as him, which is really sick. Thank you, man. I, no, I really, really appreciate that. I, I have heard people say that before, but I think, yeah, I, I definitely understand what you're saying. He's just like on such another level. <laughs> like the guy is absolutely incredible, especially from like a, like just from a composing and a production standpoint, like I've watched him like, you know, go through all of his tracks and like showcase everything. And I'm like, God, like you're an actual genius. Yeah. Like living, breathing genius. Well, yeah. Guys, guys are really incredible. Well, who knows? Maybe one day you you keep going you keep going on this progression you're going maybe soon maybe soon you'll be dubbed the unofficial protege of town <laughs> the town sem protege That's sure it. i can't wait <laughs> i'm i'm going to make it happen i'm going to contact devin and be like let's go actually i have been in contact with devin really um well his management because okay. we did an episode of sagas on empath and um the album mm. and yeah and then I contacted his Facebook and then his management replied. And I was like, hey, um, can I get in contact with him? And they're like, nah, but what do you want? <laughs> and then I was nah, like, but oh. what do you want? Yeah, pretty much. And I was like, oh, well, can you just share share this episode on his Facebook maybe? And, and they're like, they're yeah. Like, sure. nah. Oh, so, they did. They said yeah, yes. they did that. So, but I, but I never got in contact with him. But um, who okay. knows? Like if I can get in contact with the management, it's only, it's only, it's only a matter of time. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of maybe. just... One step closer, for sure. Yeah, and then if I ever do, the first thing I'm going to say is you got to listen to this guy. He's literally your protege. <laughs> he was but um, well, I I don't want to know what he says to that. Hey, please hey, don't come tell. On. He me. seems like a pretty chill, dude. He might be like, <laughs> oh yeah, he'd probably say something really nice, like, oh, I, that's very nice of you to say that. Uh, it's not really my style. He'll he'll just kind of rip on it, but like in a nice way. Uh, he'll we'll be like, see, this but... is not this is not the worst thing I've ever heard, but you know, it's not my it's not for me. Well. If I ever get in contact with them, we'll find out. Um, right. nah, so, yeah, it's um, look, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you even in this 37-degree hellhole that I'm in right now. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how you're doing it, man. And you're negative six. <laughs> drastic, drastic difference. Yeah, literally more drastic than 37 degrees. More than 37 degrees difference. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty it's insane. Not in zero. Yeah. No, it's been fun. Um, I'm gonna obviously um post this after I do all the stuff I uh, stuff I do. All. I'll send it to you once it's all done, and and obviously we'll keep in contact because we have a lot more in common than I thought we did. So this yeah, absolutely. A, this could be a spark of a new friendship. Absolutely, let's do it. Nice. All right. Well, thank you very much. And once you get any live footage from this upcoming tour, send it to me asap. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do for sure. I'll send spark. you all the best ones. Yes, thank or you. I sound the best. And then once you do, <laughs> I'll share it on Sagas and we'll get your ball rolling. Wicked, dude. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again. And I'll um, talk to you soon. Sounds good, man. Take care. Yeah.